if you had told me that I would be stuck at home on Valentine's Day editing videos because of a virus, I would have laughed at your face. I wouldn't have believed you at all. But guess what? It's happened. And during this time, I've had some time on my hand to look into gene editing and learn about it. So what is gene editing? It's the technologies that allow us to change the genome of any living organisms, from mice to fish to even humans. It's crazy to think that we now have the ability to take out, edit, or change the DNA of any living organism. Gene editing technologies that exist right now are things such as CRISPR, Talens, or ZFN. CRISPR is the most efficient and is also the cheapest one that exists today. So of course, this cool technology exists and I want to get my hands on it and test it out. But unfortunately, all the labs in my area are closed because of this virus. But there are amazing companies that exist, such as the Odin, that sell biohacking kits to anyone. So now anyone in the world can edit the genome of E. coli in their house. You can do it in your basement or in your kitchen or wherever. That is exactly what I'm going to be doing in this video. And I'm going to show you how I did it and how you can do it too from your basement. This is the science behind what we'll be doing today. So your body makes proteins in order to function. Proteins are long chains of amino acids. Proteins are made with cellular devices called ribosomes. The code for the amino acids that make up the protein are originally on the DNA, but the DNA is too big to exit the nucleus of the cell. So instead, an mRNA comes and copies the code on the DNA, actually making a reverse copy of it. This is the process of transcription. Then the mRNA attaches to a ribosome in the cytoplasm of the cell and it is translated by the ribosome in codons. Codons are three bases on the mRNA which then translate into an amino acid which is brought over by a tRNA. The amino acids then link together to form a chain which is called a protein. In this experiment, we're growing the bacteria on a media that contains molecules of streptomycin, which attaches to the ribosome and, and prevents it from making proteins. And thus, the bacteria cannot replicate and grow. In order to fix this problem, we're going to be making a mutation in the ribosomal subunit protein, RPCL, that will prevent streptomycin from binding it, and thus allowing the bacteria to grow on the streptomycin media. What we're doing is changing a single DNA base so that the lysine amino acid at position 43 is turned to th threonine. To make this edit, we are going to be using a CRISPR-Cas9 complex, which includes a gRNA and a Cas9 enzyme. A Cas9 enzyme is very similar to a molecular scissor that we go in the DNA and cut out a piece. And then the gRNA guides this Cas9 enzyme to the proper location. Once the gRNA identifies the location on the genome we want to cut out, the Cas9 cleaves it, creating a double-stranded break. We will be sending in a DNA template to make a specific homology directed repair to this part of the DNA in order to change the code of the amino acid from lysine to threonine. Now that we have a mutated version of the RPSL protein, streptomycin can no longer attach itself to the ribosome and now the E. coli can continue to grow on the streptomycin media. So the materials that the kit comes with are the LD agar media um, and the LD um, strep can arabinose uh, media and also a tube for measuring the LD media. Then it comes with a 250 milliliter glass bottle and my personal favorite, a pipette. And then these are pipette tips. Bag of micro centrifuge tubes and a micro centrifuge Black, and key tree plates, some gloves because we're going to be using E. coli, micro centrifuge tubes containing LD block, and a bacterial transformation buffer. 
So those are all the non-perishable materials. Now these are the perishable ones that need to be stored in a freezer um, when you receive them. So they contain the gRNA plasmid, the Cas9 plasmid, and the template DNA, as well as non-pathogenic E. coli and a sterile water tube. While we'll be doing the first part of the experiment, I'm just placing it in this pocket and then putting it in the freezer so that we can use them later on. So in this first part of the experiments, we're going to be preparing everything and we need gloves. So put on your gloves and I'm gonna get right back to you. First, we're going to be preparing agar plates. To do that, we're going to pour our agar solution into the glass bottle that was given. We're going to measure 150 milliliters of water using the measuring tube. The measuring tube is 50 milliliters, so we fill it three times. Then we put the cap back on and then we shake the bottle vigorously. And it should look something like this. Now to melt the agar, we're going to put the bottle into the microwave multiple times in different sessions for 30 seconds or less. But we don't want the agar to boil, so watch out for that. Make sure the lid is unscrewed before you put the bottle into the microwave, otherwise your bottle will explode. This is what your solution should not look like. If it looks like this, take it out of the microwave and let it cool down before putting it back in. You don't want to have those bubbles in there. Continue to put the agar back into the microwave until all of the agar is melted. Leave your bottle to cool down for 20 to 30 minutes. After the agar solution has cooled down for 20-30 minutes, while it's still a little bit warm, we're going to pour it into the petri dishes. You're going to need 7 petri dishes and um, you're going to pour the solution on the bottom half of the petri dish. So, um, this is the bottom half, this is the top half. You can see that the top half is a bit wider than in the bottom, that's how you can recognize it. Pour a very, very small amount of agar into the petri dish. Once the lid is put back on top, um, let the agar solidify for an hour. So now that the petri dishes have been out for an hour and the LB agar is solidified, we're going to put it in the freezer at 4 degrees Celsius so that the condensation on top of the petri dish goes away. And how we're going to do this is we're going to flip the petri dish upside down and then place it in your freezer. I'm using a refrigerator. Leave the petri dishes in the fridge for as long as the condensation goes away. Repeat the same steps for LB strep can arabinose and make sure to do it in the other set of the petri dishes. After the agar is prepared, we're going to now grow the bacteria. In this next step, we're going to be growing bacteria. But to first access the E. coli, we're going to put sterile water into the tube using a pipet. Then we shake the tube containing the E. coli and the sterile water for one minute. So we put the sterile water into the E. coli. And then we took out the E. coli with pipette, put it at the very corner of the uh, agar plate, and then using an inoculation loop, we just did a little crisscross patterns without breaking into the agar itself, just spreading it on the surface, and we did it just multiple, multiple times. And now we let it dry, and we're going to put it somewhere 37 Celsius degrees so that it grows for one or two days. So I'll be back in one or two days. Hey, so it's been two days and the bacteria has grown. Unfortunately, when I was swirling the bacteria on the agar, I didn't spread it out enough. You can see like lines of the swirls there, but not enough. So it's all really concentrated in this corner, but we can still use it. So now we're going to add the transformation mix to the bacteria. First, we put 100 microliters of the transformation mix into a microcentrifuge tube. And then using the smaller end of an inoculation loop, we're going to get some bacteria on there until it's full. And then we put the bacteria into the transformation mix, which is in the microcentrifuge tube. And then we mix it until all the big clumps of bacteria are mixed in. I made the big mistake of using the bigger end of the inoculation loop, so it was so much harder mixing the bacteria into the solution. I wanted to show your solution should look something like this, where it's cloudy, uh, but not opaque. You can see through it. 
So this is what it should look like. I repeated this process for two more micro centrifuge tubes because I wanted to do experiment three times. Okay, so I need three um, samples to experiment with. You can start right away, but I'm going to do my experiments tomorrow. So if you're going to wait like me, you need to store these um, centrifuge uh, containers in a fridge at 4 degrees Celsius and keep the rest of your bacteria um, in a warm area about 37 celsius is preferable i keep mine at um about 23 degrees celsius so yeah put these away in the fridge if you're not going to do your experiments right away so now i'm going to add the cas9 grna and template dna to the mixture of our transformation mix and bacteria you can still see that this mix is cloudy so let's get to it in this step we're going to be putting the grna and the cas9 plasmid and the dna template into the bacteria solution so starting with the cas9 solution we get 55 microliters of sterile water and put it into the cas9 solution with a pipette then we shake this solution and then we switch the tip of the pipette and then take 10 microliters from the cast eye solution, which now contains sterile water, and then put it into our bacteria solution, which is in one of those microcentrifuge tubes. Then close the microcentrifuge tube and then shake it by just flicking your wrist or lightly tap it against a table or desk, which is what I ended up doing to get the DNA droplets to get to the bottom of the microcentrifuge tube. These solutions are supposed to look yellow. The DNA solution should look yellow. Um, right now, my GRNA solution is yellow, but my Cas9 solution wasn't yellow. So in that case, you're gonna have to take a photo and send it into um, Odin, um, send it to them and see what the problem is. Now I'm going to repeat all those steps that I used for a Cas9 solution for the gRNA plasmid solution and the DNA template, making sure to switch the pipette tips between each step as I showed previously. Okay, so now that we've added in all of the DNA solutions, I'm going to put this the bacterial solution back into the fridge for 30 minutes and the fridge is at 4 degrees celsius now we're going to heat shock the bacteria because we want the pores on the cell membrane to open up allowing the dna strands to enter into the bacteria so we need to have a 42 degrees celsius water and then we leave the uh, bacteria solution in this water for 30 seconds. You can approximate the temperature of the water by putting your hand in it and if it's warm enough to warm your hand but not burn it, it should be good. But for more accuracy, use a thermometer. Use the measuring tube to get 1.5 milliliters of tap water. Pour that 1.5 milliliters of water into a 1.5 milliliter microcentrifuge tube containing LB agar, which is food for the bacteria to grow. Shake the tube to mix the agar with the water. And if there are clumps of agar floating in the solution, then you can lightly tap the tube against the table just as we did when we were mixing the DNA strands with the bacteria solution. Now with the pipit, put 250 microliters of the LB agar solution into the bacteria solution. Remember that because the pipit only goes up to 100 microliters, you're going to have to um, repeat this process multiple times to get 250 milliliters into the bacteria solution. Okay, now your solution containing your uh, bacteria, DNA, and now your agar is going to be incubated for 1 to 4 hours at 30 degrees Celsius or you can incubate it at room temperature but for a longer amount of time 
However, make sure not to incubate it at 37 degrees Celsius. Now this process, this step is very important because it is a step that allows the DNA to replicate itself and allow the CRISPR engineering part of this experiment to work. Now I'm going to leave my solution for 12 hours actually and more. The longer amount of time, the better. But don't skimp on the time. Minimum should be one to four hours. Now to test out if the CRISPR part of the experiment worked out, we're going to be putting the bacteria solution into LB strep can arabinose plates. And then we're going to do this using a pipette. So you're going to put the whole bacteria solution into one LB strep can arabinose plate. Once you put the bacteria solution at the corner of the plate, you're going to use an inoculation loop with the bigger end to swirl the bacteria on the plate. And you're going to do these with continuous motions of your hand and be careful not to break into the agar. So you should do this very gently. Before putting the lid back on, make sure that the bacteria is dry. I'm going to put the lid of the plate back on and we're going to flip the plate and keep it somewhere that's 30 degrees Celsius warm uh, for 24 to 36 hours. However, if you're keeping your plates at room temperature, it needs to be kept for 36 to 48 hours. But make sure, do not store your bacteria anywhere that is 37 degrees Celsius. I will keep my bacteria in my room at room temperature and I will be checking on them each day to see when I will see the results. Something that must be noted about the two solutions I prepared was that I um, incubated one of the solutions for two days and the other solution for one day only. So that may affect the results. However, I did not identify which two contained the two day incubated solution and which two contained the one day incubated solution. So it's been about 13 days since I allowed the bacteria to grow and they have actually grown quite a lot as you can see. So the experiment did work. However, one thing I'll point out is that in the first week, they barely grow. And in the second week, they started looking like this. And as you can see, there's also these orange spots that I still don't know what they are. I'll have to do some research into what these are and if they are the E. coli bacteria just growing. Okay, pause. So I found out that if the E. coli colony is brown it just means that the colony is older so it's not as young anymore otherwise the white patches we know are um meant to be e coli growing so it just it means that the e coli were able to survive so uh this could suggest that the crispr experiment did work however to figure that out fully we would have to dna sequence this but i don't have the technologies at home to do that if we did, we could find out if CRISPR really did make a difference in the genome of these E. coli, allowing them to survive in this agar.